So let's now dig into the technical details of Bitcoin's consensus algorithm. And uh, while we're looking at that, we should keep in mind that Bitcoin does all of this without nodes having any persistent long-term identities. And this is yet again a difference from how traditional distributed consensus algorithms operated. And if nodes did have identities, it would make things a lot easier for a couple of reasons. One is a pragmatic reason. It would allow you to put into your protocol things like now the node with the lowest numerical ID should take some step or something like that. So that's a simple pragmatic reason, which already, if nodes are completely anonymous, becomes harder to do. But a much more serious reason for nodes to have identities is for security, because if nodes were identified and it weren't uh, trivial to create new nodes ide node identities, then we could make assumptions like, let's say that less than 50% of the nodes are malicious, and we could derive security properties out of that. So for both of these reasons, uh, the consensus protocol in Bitcoin is a bit harder. But why is it exactly that Bitcoin nodes don't have identities? Well, it's for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, if you're in a decentralized model in a peer-to-peer -peer system, there is no central authority to give identities to nodes and verify that they're not creating uh, uh, new nodes at will. And in fact, the technical term for this is a Sybil attack. Sybils are just copies of nodes that a, a malicious adversary can create to look like there are a lot of different participants when in fact all those pseudo participants are really controlled by the same adversary. The other reason is that pseudonymity is inherently a goal of Bitcoin. Even if it were uh, possible or easy to establish identities for all nodes or all participants, we wouldn't necessarily want to do that. So Bitcoin doesn't give you strong anonymity guarantees out of the box, in that the different transactions that you make uh, can probably be linked together. But at the same time, nobody is forcing you to put your real life uh, identity like your name or IP address or anything like that in order to participate in the peer-to-peer -peer network and in the blockchain, and that's an important property. So what we can do instead is we can make a weaker assumption. And I kind of want you to take a leap of faith with me here that this weaker assumption is something uh, that uh, is going to be feasible. And I'm going to make this assumption here and later show you how this is actually accomplished. And what this weaker assumption is, is that we're going to assume that there is some ability somehow to pick a random node in the system. And a good motivating analogy for this it's a lottery or a raffle or any number of uh, real life systems where tracking and verifying people and giving them identities and verifying those identities is pretty hard. And so what we do in those contexts is we might give them tokens or tickets or something of that sort. And that then enables us to later pick a random token ID and call upon that person. So we're going to do something similar with respect to these Bitcoin nodes and further assume for the moment that this token generation and distribution algorithm has enough smarts so that the, if the adversary is going to try to create a lot of Sybil nodes, together all of those Sybils just get one token so the adversary is not able to multiply his power that way. So let's make this assumption for now and let's see what becomes possible if we make this assumption. Here's the key idea. What becomes possible under this assumption of random node selection is something called implicit consensus. So what is implicit consensus? In each round, and there are going to be multiple rounds, each round corresponding to a different block in the blockchain, in each round a random node is somehow selected, magically for the moment, and this node gets to propose the next block in the chain. There is no consensus algorithm, there is no voting, this node simply unilaterally proposes what the next block in the blockchain is going to be. But what if that node is malicious? Well, there is a process for this but it is an implicit one. Other nodes will implicitly accept or reject that block. And how will they do that? If they accept that block, they will signal, signal that acceptance by extending the blockchain starting from that block, or if they reject that block, they will extend the chain by ignoring that block and starting from whatever was the previous latest block in the blockchain. And technically, how is that implemented? Recall that each block contains a hash of the block that it extends, and this is the technical mechanism that allows nodes to signal which block it is that they're extending. So given this, this is what the overall consensus algorithm in Bitcoin is going to look like. Now, this is a little bit simplified, and the reason it's simplified is, again, that I'm assuming sort of this magic random node selection process. But except for that simplification, this is pretty close to how Bitcoin actually works. So whenever Alice wants to pay Bob, she will create a transaction and she will broadcast it to all of the nodes. 
And any one of these nodes is constantly listening to the network and collecting a list of outstanding transactions that have not yet made it into the blockchain. At some point, one of these nodes is going to be randomly called upon to propose the next block. It's going to round up all of the outstanding transactions that it's heard about and propose that block. Now, presumably that node was honest, but it could also be a malicious node or a faulty node and propose a block that contains some invalid transactions. Invalid transactions uh, are those that uh, don't have the right crypto signature or where the transaction is already spent. In other words, an attempt to double spend. So if that happens, other nodes are going to signal their acceptance or reje rejection of the block, as we saw on the last slide, by either including the hash of this latest block in their next block or ignoring this block and including the hash of whatever was the previous block that they considered to be valid. Right. So now let's try to understand why this consensus algorithm works. And the way I like to understand this is instead of asking why this works, let's try to ask how can a malicious adversary try to subvert this process? So let's look at that for a second. So here we have a couple of blocks in the blockchain. Uh, assume that this extends to the left a long way back, all the way to what is called the genesis block. But here I'm only showing you a couple of blocks in the blockchain. And that pointer that you see over there is a block referring to what is the previous block that it extends by including a hash of that previous block within its own contents. So let's, a malicious attacker, let's call her Alice, what might she try to do? Can she simply steal bitcoins belonging to another user at a different address that she doesn't control? Now, even if it is now Alice's turn to propose the next block in this chain, she cannot steal other users' bitcoins. Why? Because she cannot forge their signatures. So as long as the underlying crypto is solid, she's not able to simply steal bitcoins. Another thing she might try to do is if she really, really hates some other user, Bob, then she, she can look at Bob's address and she can decide that any transactions originating from Bob's address, she will simply not include them in any block that she proposes to get onto the blockchain. In other words, she's denying service to Bob. So this is a valid attack that she can try to mount. But luckily, it's nothing more than a little annoyance because if Bob's block doesn't make it into the next block that Alice proposes, he will just wait another block until an honest node gets the chance to propose a block and then his transaction will get into that block. So that's not really a good attack either. So the only one that we're really left with for what a malicious node can try to do here is called a double spending attack. So how might a double spending attack work? To understand that, Let's assume that Alice is a customer of some online uh, merchant or a website run by Bob who provides some online service in exchange for payment in bitcoins. Let's say he allows the download of some software. So here's how a double spending attack might work. Alice goes to Bob's website and decides to buy this item, pays for it with bitcoins, and what that means in technical terms is that she's going to create a bitcoin transaction from her address to Bob's address. She broadcasts it to the network. And let's say that some honest node creates the next block, listens to this transaction, and includes it in that block. So what is going on here? So there is this block that was created by an honest node that contains a transaction that represents a payment from Alice to the merchant Bob. By C subscript A, I mean a coin belonging to Alice, and that is now being sent to Bob's address. Let's zoom into this in a little bit more technical detail. A transaction, as we saw earlier, is a data structure that contains Alice's signature here and an instruction to pay to Bob's public key and also a hash. What is this hash? This hash represents a pointer to the transaction where Alice in fact received that coin from somebody else and that must be a pointer to a transaction that was included in some previous block in the consensus chain. So visually, it's going to look something like this. Let's, let's pause for a second here because there is something subtle going on. There are at least two different types of pointers in this diagram that I've showed you. There's in fact a third one corresponding to Merkle trees, but we're not gonna look at that uh, at the present moment. But these two types of uh, pointers that I refer to are blocks that include a hash of the previous block that they're extending and transactions that include a pointer to whatever the previous transaction uh, that uh, where the coin came from. Right, so this is the situation. And uh, uh, this block was now generated by an honest node. Uh, 
And now let's assume that the next time a random node is called, that node is a malicious node controlled by Alice. Right? So this is the blockchain as it stands right now. Bob has already looked at this blockchain, decided that Alice has paid him, and has allowed Alice to download the software or whatever it is that she was buying on his website. Right. So as far as Bob is concerned, he's satisfied, the transaction is completed, Alice has now received her goods in exchange for the payment. Now what might happen is if Alice now gets to propose the next block, she could propose a block that looks like this, ignores altogether this valid block over here, and instead contains a pointer to the previous block. And furthermore, it's going to contain a transaction that contains a transfer of coins of Alice's coins to another address, A prime, that's also controlled by Alice. So this is a classic double spend pattern. What is going on here is Alice now creates a new transaction that transfers that coin instead of to Bob's address to another address owned by her. And visually it's going to look like this. This is a completely different transaction, also with a hash pointer going back to the same transaction referred to earlier. Right. So this is what an attempt at a double spend looked like. And how do we know if this double spend attempt is going to succeed or not? Well, that depends on whether this green transaction here or this red transaction is going to ultimately end up in the long-term consensus chain. So what determines that? That is determined by the fact that honest nodes are always following the policy of extending the longest valid branch. So now, which of these is the longest valid branch? You might look at this and say, aha, the first one is the longest valid branch, not the second one, because it's a double spend attempt. But here's a very subtle point that I want you to appreciate. From sort of a moral point of view, this transaction in green and the transaction in red might look very different, because uh, uh, based on the explanation that I've given you, the first one is an attempt by Alice to pay Bob, whereas the second one is an attempt by Alice to defraud Bob and pay coins back to herself. But from a technological point of view, these two transactions are completely identical. The nodes that are looking at this really have no way to tell which one is the legitimate transaction. I'm putting legitimate in air quotes because it's a moral judgment that we apply to it. It's not a technical distinction. Uh, versus which one is the attempted double spend. It could easily be the other way around. Now, nodes often follow a heuristic of extending the block that they first heard about on the peer-to-peer -peer network, but it's not a solid rule, and in any case, because of network latency, uh, that could easily be the other way around. So now there is at least some chance that the next node that gets to propose a block will extend this block instead of this one. Or it could be that even if it's an honest node, Alice could try to bribe that node or try to subvert the process in a variety of ways. So for whatever reason, without going too much into the details, let's say that the next node extends the block with the red transaction instead of the green one. What this means is that at this point, the next honest node is much more likely to extend this block instead of this one because now this has become the longest valid chain. So let's say that after one more block, the situation looks like this. Now it's starting to look pretty likely that this double spend has succeeded. In fact, what might happen is that this ends up the long-term consensus chain, and this block gets completely ignored by the network, and this is now called an orphan block, and this is an example of a successful double spend. So now let's look at this whole situation from Bob the Merchant's point of view, and understanding how Bob can protect himself from this double spending attack is really going to be a key part of understanding Bitcoin security. So let's uh, look at what happened here again. We have a couple of blocks in the blockchain, and at this point, Alice broadcasts a transaction that represents her payment to Bob. And so Bob is going to hear about it on the peer-to-peer -peer network right here, even before the next block gets created. And so Bob can do something even more foolhardy than what he did in the previous slide, which is that as soon as he hears about the transaction on the peer-to-peer -peer network, he can complete the transaction on the website and allow Alice to download whatever she's downloading. That's called a zero confirmation transaction. Or he could wait until the uh, transaction gets one confirmation in the blockchain, which means that at least some node has uh, uh, created a block and has proposed this transaction, and that has gone into the blockchain. But as we saw earlier, even after one confirmation, there could be an attempt at a double spend. So let's say that this actually happens, 
If, as in the previous slide, the double spend attempt succeeds, what Bob should do is to realize that the block that he thought represented Alice paying him has now been orphaned and, and so he should abandon the transaction. Instead, if it so happens that despite this double spend attempt, the next block that's generated turns out to extend the block that he's interested in. Now he sees that his transaction has two confirmations in the blockchain. Now he gets a little bit more confidence that his transaction is going to end up on the long-term consensus chain. So let's say there's one more, and now there are three confirmations. In general, the more confirmations your transaction gets, the higher the probability that it is going to end up on the long-term consensus chain. Because if you recall, the honest node's behavior that they will always extend the longest valid branch that they see, the chance that uh, this one is going to catch up to this longer branch is now very minuscule, especially if only a minority of the nodes are malicious. Right? Because it typically, the only reason that this double spend attempt block would be extended at this point is if the next node to be picked randomly was a malicious node, and then you'd need another malicious node and then another for the shorter branch to then become the longer branch. In general, the double spend probability decreases exponentially with the number of confirmations. So if the transaction you're interested in has received k confirmations, then the probability that this other transaction is going to uh, end up on the long-term consensus chain goes down exponentially as a function of k. And the most common heuristic that's used in the Bitcoin ecosystem is that you wait for six confirmations. There is nothing really special about the number six. It's just a good trade-off between the amount of time you have to wait and your guarantee that the transaction you're interested in ends up on the consensus blockchain. So let's recap what we saw here. Protection against invalid transactions, that is protection against a malicious node simply making up a transaction to steal someone's Bitcoins is entirely cryptographic, but it is enforced by consensus, which means that uh, if a node does attempt that, then the only reason that that transaction won't end up in the long-term consensus chain is because a majority of the nodes are honest and will treat that transaction as invalid. On the other hand, protection against double spending is purely by consensus. Uh, cryptography has nothing to say about this, and true transactions that re represent a double spending attempt kind of look identical from the perspective of signatures and so on, but it's the consensus that determines which one will end up on the long-term consensus chain. And finally, you're never 100% sure that a transaction you're interested in is on the consensus branch, but this exponential probability guarantee is pretty good. After about six transactions, there's virtually no chance that, uh, uh, that you're going to go wrong.